Tonight I'm going to talk about the argument I make in this new book, The End of America. And I'm just going to speak from my heart about what I see happening right now and what we need to do about it. And I kind of want to issue a bit of a, a not a warning, but almost like a, you know, like those rides you go on in Disneyland where, you know, if they're very turbulent, you, you get a heads up. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult message. In some ways, I'm going to take you on a difficult journey, but I want to reassure you that we're going to come out to sunshine and, and hope, if not sunshine, certainly hope, on the other side. So the book, this is why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for an older person and for a younger person in my life. Um, the older person is a mentor of mine who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And we would sit around chatting about news events. And she kept saying, they did this in Germany. They did this in Germany. And at, you know, at that time, I thought that this was a nutty thing to say, really extreme, really rhetorical. And I just disregarded it. But she kept saying, they did this in Germany. They did it in Germany. And she wasn't talking about the later years, uh, National Socialist outcomes. She was talking about the early years, 1930, 1931, 1932, when Germany was a modern parliamentary democracy, a fragile one. But it would have been very recognizable to us. Germany in the early 30s had pop stars and Bauhaus architecture and Paris fashion and civil rights organizations, gay rights organizations, sex education organizations, uh, you know, page six writers, you know, gossip columnists. And it was a democracy. And so she was talking about the very early pressures on a democracy, legal pressures on a democracy, by people who were intent on closing down that democracy. And, you know, I, I kept sort of brushing this off, but finally she sat me down and she gave me a stack of books and she almost physically said, you know, read. And I started reading. And honestly, my hair stood on end because I saw that she was right. She wasn't being rhetorical at all. That in fact, not only were there tactical echoes from the past, but that what I was seeing was actual scenes recurring, imagery recurring, language, sound bites recurring in modern events in America. So then I began reading even more about uh, how societies, how democracies close down or how would-be despots crack down on a democracy movement. So I read about Italy in the 20s, and all, as always, Mussolini was the great innovator. He sort of pioneered this technology of closing down a modern democracy. Um, I read about Germany in the 30s, as I mentioned, about Russia in the 30s, about East Germany in the 50s, Czechoslovakia in the 60s, Pinochet's coup in Chile, and I read about the Chinese crackdown on the democracy movement at the end of the 80s. And what became completely clear to me is that every would-be despot, every would-be dictator, whether they're on the left or the right, does the same 10 things. There's a blueprint to closing down an open society or crushing a democracy movement. And that you know, Mussolini kind of drafted this blueprint and then Hitler studied Mussolini, Stalin studied Hitler, Hitler studied... Some governors are still refusing to take action to protect their own citizens. The media keep insisting government must set stricter rules. Ten states have no stay-at-home orders. Even some on Fox say it. It is necessary to shut things down everywhere. And that includes Utah, Wyoming. Wait a second, has he ever been to Wyoming? It's got so much open space. Why would the same rules apply here as in New York? It's creepy how some people are so eager to have authorities boss us around. Police departments now monitor people with drones. This is the Volusia Sheriff's Office. Please adhere to social distancing guidelines. Now some people are saying enough. These people are protesting North Carolina's stay-at-home order. I feel that my rights have been completely removed. On Twitter, the police declared protesting is a non-essential activity, and they arrested this woman. But wait a second, the Bill of Rights does say the American people have a right to peaceably assemble and petition the government. All public and private gatherings 
of any size are prohibited. Michigan's governor probably imposed the harshest rule. Residents can no longer visit friends or relatives. Those who have more than one home banned from traveling between them. No wonder people staged this protest against her rules. They say it goes too far, takes away their rights, and in some cases is too arbitrary. Arbitrary is how it looks. Big stores may stay open but they must not sell certain things. Big box stores will also have to close areas of the store that are dedicated to things like carpet or flooring, furniture, garden centers, plant nurseries, or paint. But things like gardening and painting are activities that could be done far from other people. So is exercise. But watch out in California. A paddleboarder is chased down by law enforcement for being out on the water at Malibu Beach. This man was more than six feet from anyone but police chased him down. <laughs> he cut him off! And they punished him. Yep, this paddle boarder was arrested. In Encelitas, California, police gave $1,000 tickets to people watching the sunset. Yes, they were inside cars, not endangering anyone. That day, the police posted this video saying, we go to work for you. We're gonna continue to be doing enforcement. We're dealing with the crisis at this point, and we want compliance from everybody because this is lives that we're trying to save. China records no new domestic cases. The media say China beat coronavirus. I don't believe what the Chinese government says, but we're told China did a better job than other countries. As China gets a handle on this pandemic, it's a different story across the globe. Across the globe, most of us are now social distancing. I'm recording this from my home and teleconferencing to communicate with my coworkers. China did that? A good part about America is that most of this is voluntary. <laughs> Not so in China, where authorities have welded people into homes to keep them inside. <laughs> or tied people to posts because they didn't wear a face mask. Chinese police use drones equipped with high-resolution cameras and loudspeakers. They shout orders to people on the street. China spies on every citizen. 200 million cameras and electronic eavesdropping let them pull together every person's political leanings and social interactions. If we see continued non-compliance, they'll wind up facing misdemeanor charge, and DWP will step in and shut off their water and power. Shut off their water? Let's be sensible about this. Stalin, the great dictators all kind of perfected it from one another. But then the petty dictators all over the world in the latter part of the 20th century, beginning of this century, reproduced the blueprint. We teach the blueprint at the School for the Americas. We teach the blueprint so that, if you remember Thailand last spring, in, you know, in one week it was a democracy, a week later it was a military dictatorship. And it was like they were going through a checking, a, a shopping list in the way they were. That was the blueprint. You see Burma, Myanmar, you know, two weeks ago, because I know the blueprint, I was looking at my watch. Today they're marching the street. In 48 hours they're going to be shooting on the monks protesting. In a week they're going to be uh, suspending communications. The blueprint is predictive. And what was even more chilling to me and this is where I really have to applaud you for coming here on a Thursday night when you could be watching America's Next Top Model and, and listening to this. Um, it's very brave of you. Uh, what became clear to me is that each of these 10 steps, these 10 classic steps that every would-be dictator puts in place are underway right now in the United States. I also had to write this book when I realized that because of a younger person in my life, two people actually, Jennifer Gandon and Chris Lee. She's a wonderful 28-year-old uh, student that I mentored, a writer, and she was marrying Chris, who's a wonderful 28-year-old activist. And knowing the storm clouds that were gathering around this young couple, I realized that you know I had to do more than just get them something from Crate and Barrel. <laughs> You know, um, that I had to give them something that would help them in a time like this. And so I, I wrote the book really for them as well as for my, my older friend because what it is is a kind of refresher, a reminder to Americans, we don't tend to think about history a lot, I don't either, you know, about how societies closed down in the past, a blueprint, and also a refresher uh, about what democracy is and how to sustain it at a time when it's under assault. Um, 
so that's why I wrote this book. And actually, Chris's own story is kind of very moving to me because his mom was 28 herself when she took the four-month-old Chris in her arms and fled Vietnam to get into a boat and sail across the ocean as a refugee, as a boat person, to arrive in this country because she understood liberty the way the founders understood liberty. You know, it's, it's an understanding we've kind of forgotten, we've gotten lazy about. She understood that it was worth risking her life and her child's life to raise her baby in liberty, in freedom. So that's the kind of consciousness we have to remember now in order to fight back against the kind of pressures that I'll be describing. So what are these 10 steps? And by the way, before I tell you the 10 steps, I just want to like invoke something that was kind of amazing to me to discover. You know, like civics is so boring, right? When you, how many of you took civics in middle school or high school? Show of hands. That's pretty good, but it's still like half of the audience, and this is a you know, self-selected, engaged audience. You know, people don't take civics anymore. It's, it's not mandatory anymore. So there's this whole generation coming up that really doesn't know what democracy is. But what we're not taught, you know, we're sort of given this like hallmark card view of the mood the founders were in when they drafted the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. It's like freedom, you know, confident, expansive. That is not true. When you go back and read the founding, the founding fathers, I mean, there were mothers too, but they were disenfranchised. Um, <laughs> took a while for, you know, us to get included. Um, you see that they were writing in a, 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 a state of dread and fear because the founders knew in their bones that an American despot could easily arise in America to oppress Americans. They knew it. They knew it from their own experience. They had fled, or their parents had fled, countries where, like in England, Tom Paine was tried for sedition, for writing the rights of man. He could have been hanged by the crown for writing that, that book. Um, you know, countries where Quakers were tortured by the state for their beliefs. That's why they came to Philadelphia. And so the founders, you know, in their hearts and their lived experiences knew what tyranny was. And so they wanted to create a place where you were safe from that kind of oppression. And that's why they set their, our system of checks and balances as they did. Checks and balances, what a boring term, right? I mean, we are not taught that this system is this sexy, passionate, amazing, inspiring concept, this radical vision of human self-determination. Um, but they knew without a doubt that it was human nature to abuse power if power was unchecked. And that that was why these checks and balances were so important. So what are these 10 steps that so profoundly assault the founder's vision and put us at risk? The first thing every would-be dictator does is to invoke a terrifying internal and external threat. The number of U.S. cases now stands at more than 9,000. That's doubling in just two days. This was something that happened that uh, was, uh, some people would say, an act of God. I don't view it as an act of God. I would view it as, uh, as uh, something that just surprised the whole world. thousand cases but I don't want to be held to that because it's 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 excuse me deaths I mean we're, we're gonna have millions of cases but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection 